going. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I will call the uh, meeting for the neighbors of Dunn County Standing Committee to order here today on January 25th. It has been duly noticed and we are ready to roll. We have three members. We have four members of the uh, standing committee. Uh, Mr. Breslin uh, is uh, had a little problem with travel this up north this morning and won't be able to make it. So with that, I call the roll. We just did approval of the minutes from last time, December 28th. Any questions or anything? If not, uh, I'll take a motion to approve them. So Supervisor Witzel, Supervisor Lyon, and any other discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Do we have any public comments? No public comments today. And there's nothing at the request of the chair. And that brings us down to number six, which we always get to real quickly. Uh, Carmen, 6A, Quality Assurance Steering Committee. All right. Um, so we met as usual for the Quality Assurance Steering Committee. Um, a lot of our conversation this month um, focused on our West survey. So anytime we have a survey, uh, we review all of any citations or sometimes they give FYIs of just things that they'd like to see different. Um, so we work on that primarily through the Quality Assurance Committee. So that was the main um, focus of our committee meeting, um, which I'll talk about the survey a little bit later too and some updates on that, but um, nothing earth shattering or anything um, different from normal. Um, we did have our medical director there as well as normal and he had some updates regarding some policy changes on the medic on medical side of things, um, as well as we um, talked about a couple of different screening tools and vaccine things that were coming through too. So. Any questions for QA? Uh, it looks like none. Okay. Um, and next would be employment activity report. Um, and Chris is on remotely. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. So for the December 2023 employment activity, um, types of recruitment were the same. Uh, number of direct hire interviews, nine. Uh, we had 10 agency interviews. Um, we offered six positions, um, actually nine were accepted. So six in the month of December accepted. With, we had uh, two December start dates. So actually eight um, were accepted. Um, number of positions offered at higher than a step three was a one. We were able to hire a registered nurse. Um, we had a couple RNs or one RN that had um, resigned and two part-time homemakers that um, didn't basically didn't return from a leave or um, the schedule didn't work with their school schedule. Um, if we go down to open positions, those would have been adjusted as such. Uh, if we go down to work comp lost hours. Uh, now again, another month with no lost time, which is good. And the number of shifts missed to COVID in December, we did have an uptick. We had about 65 missed shifts or roughly 585 hours. Um, a little bit lower, I think we had some homemakers on the three or four hour shifts that were positive. So, um, or not positive, but had called out. So that's why the, you know, it doesn't quite max up with the 65 shifts to 585 hours. It was some of the lower hour positions had missed. So any questions on that? December was pretty quiet. Yeah. Supervisor Lino. Yes, I've got some questions regarding um, employment now you said that uh, was it six or nine accepted the position uh offers accepted oh sorry yep i got that on off a little bit nine or ten position nine positions were offered nine positions were accepted oh okay and then um i heard also that you said an rn had resigned correct uh was there um if I may ask uh, the reason for it or just going someplace else or what? Um, as noted on the report, she accepted a position with hospice. 
Oh, okay. So All right. Went into a different field of nursing. Okay. And I'm assuming you heard the news about uh, the shakeup in, in the health uh, services in the area these days, right? Yep. Yes, I can actually address that. Um, sure. So uh, the, as everyone is well aware in our community has, um, there's been an announcement that HSHS is closing two hospitals as well as the Purveya clinics are closing um, in the Chippewa Valley. So with that, um, we jumped on that as quickly as possible. Um, so myself and Jenna from HR and Sarah Stansberry from HR as well have met a couple times now regarding plans for um, recruitment of those employees as there's a lot of nurses at those locations um, that are now looking for jobs. Um, so we met a couple times this week about it. We're going to be making a promotional video with Krista Vind um, that then is going to be put on a targeted ad on Facebook, um, as well as Chris has contacted the person that does our um, local outreach ad. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but has done things for um, news related press releases for the county um, to do something for us as well. We are going to be hosting two walk-in interview days um, where people can just come in and it's an open day that we have multiple people available to conduct interviews. And we're going to advertise that um, with the help of the person that's doing the press release things. I and mean, we've also talked about um, putting out a radio ad. So the video is going to be filmed next week. Um, currently, most of our houses are in a COVID outbreak due to some positive staff. So we were hoping to wait until we don't have to have masks on for the video, mm -hmm. which is next Thursday. Um, so that is when Krista is going to come over to the neighbors and film that. And she said she hopes that she can have it completed by the following Tuesday. And then we would put that out um, for public as well. conducted at least one interview so far. Um, and then we have others that are coming in pretty steadily now. Excellent. Well, with this um, hopefully glut of potential new hires, um, are we looking at uh, possibly opening up the other wing? Um, I don't think we're at that part at that point yet. Um, the first step would be fully opening Fireside. So right now we're only admitting half full in Fireside. Um, which is about eight people. Um, if we were able to fully staff um, that household, we would then expand that to being completely open. Um, and then the next step would be opening Arrowhead. I don't think we're to that point yet. Um, I would, we need, a, the bigger issue is that we need a lot of CNAs. Nurses would be excellent um, if we had enough nurses to, um, but I, I don't see us getting a ton of CNA applications from those places because they, employ a lot more nurses than they do CNAs in hospital settings. Um, and CNAs is where our biggest need is to open those households, um, but it would help. Um, but we'll keep assessing that. And if we do get enough staff from this situation, then we would look at opening as well. All right, so essentially what I hear you saying is that we need, what about eight or 10 CNA positions to fully staff the one spot that we're short on? Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I would say um, position wise to fully staff um, both the two households. So right now we're partially staffing Fireside. Um, so for full staff would be two CNAs and a nurse on day shift, two CNAs and a nurse on PMs, and then a CNA on night shift for each house. Um, so we'd have to fully staff Fireside first. And then if we got to that point, then we look at fully staffing Arrowhead, which would be all of those positions. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but there is a shot. I mean, we're going to we're going to try at that as a potential goal, <laughs> yes. right? Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Barb, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah, way to jump on that. Uh, that was really, really good getting together with uh, human resources. Nice job. Any other questions on 6B? We'll leave that positive note uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not for others, but uh, 6C. 
All right, um, the CNA training program, I just have a brief update on this. Um, I brought this up last month that we were approved for the CNA training program. Um, we actually have folks from that company coming out tomorrow uh, to get the room ready and organized in the way that they do things because um, they have a setup and a system. We have most of the equipment that they require. Um, they gave us a list of all of the things that they need to run a class and do all the things, um, which because we had previously had CNA classes there, we have most of that stuff. So there's just a couple things that we need to get, um, things like a regular scale. We don't have that. They have to, CNAs have to learn how to properly weigh people and things, which we use chair scales. And so there's a couple of things that we need to get, but fairly minimal cost. Um, and they're going to be setting that up and uh, tomorrow, uh, they're there most of the day. And then we're hoping for our first group of students to start in March is the goal. Um, so we are pretty excited about that. Um, they're hoping to start with evening classes and see how that goes. Um, and then uh, potentially in the summer having classes during the day as well. It's okay. <laughs> Another quick question. You said you needed chairs? Had to buy some chairs? Uh, no, so we, oh. um, we need a scale. Um, so we only use what's called a chair scale. Oh. So it's basically a chair that a resident sits in that then weighs them. We, um, and we, that's typically how we weigh residents. But one of the requirements for the state licensure stuff is to have a regular scale. So there's just a couple things like that, that we need to purchase to, um, be able to have the class. But, so we're working on that, um, just a couple of random things. Like I think that was one of them. A uh, regular razor was one of them. We don't use regular razors. We only have residents use electric razors because less likely to cut people and things like that. So there's just a couple things that we don't use at our facility, but are required for the CNA training course. All right, thank you. I just didn't quite catch that. That's okay. <laughs> um, good, <clears throat> that's good news too. Uh, okay, D. Yep, uh, resident referral report. Um, so at the beginning of the month, we had 111 residents. We had 79 referrals. Uh, we had five admissions and we had 74 people not admitted. At the end of the month, we had 106 residents. We had zero residents transferred to other facilities. We had four deaths and seven discharges. Um, our referral sources were pretty similar to normal. We did have Marshfield on there this month. That was, we don't typically get a lot of referrals from Marshfield, um, but we got a couple and then the two Mayos. Um, we didn't have any from Sacred Heart this month and that is, as we've discussed, going to go away anyways. Um, that was one of the, I actually got a phone call from our um, director of quality assurance or division of quality assurance and the regional director yesterday um, as they're calling nursing homes and providers to see the impact that the closures are going to have on our residents. Um, for us, there's a very minimal impact. We don't get a ton of referrals from Sacred Heart. I would say normally one a month is a person from Sacred Heart. Um, and we don't use Sacred Hearts doctors and most of our residents are Mayo patients. Um, so they see Mayo doctors um, when they go out for appointments too. So it won't have a huge impact on us, um, which is a good thing for our residents. Um, but it was a question that was brought up um, to all of us. Uh, this month was a little bit lower on admissions than the last couple, um, primarily because we were pretty full um, for what we were staffed to. Um, so all of the outer buildings were full and then half of Fireside and Deerview was completely full. Um, we also at the end of the month um, and then coming into January as well, um, we had quite a bit of COVID um, going on in across basically the whole campus. Um, we've had on and off staff COVID, uh, we did have a resident outbreak in our West building. Everybody recovered and is doing well at this point, but we did have several residents test positive um, right after the holidays. Uh, so um, families are there, there's a lot more people, um, staff go home and see families, lots of group gatherings. Um, so as there was an uptick in the community, there was also some at our facility. And then we've also had staff test positive 
Um, we still are required to wear masks if a staff person tests positive um, in the area that they worked in. Uh, so if a CNA works in Deerview, for example, which is one of the households in Central, and they test positive and they had worked that day or the day before, um, then that household is then considered in an outbreak and the residents are tested. And then that household is required to wear masks for 14 days. Currently, um, of the eight open households, seven are in an outbreak. Unfortunately, we had a staff member from a department that travels across campus um, and sees one-off people across campus from our therapy department test positive. So um, that put every household but one into an outbreak. So um, we're dealing with that at the moment, but um, they will be, knock on wood, out of outbreak next week. Well, Thursday will be the day that they're out, able to stop wearing masks and things like that. Is there any questions on referrals? Um, yeah, one quick question sure. is that, you know, we, we're having these heart outbreaks. So I'm assuming they're all COVID, not yep. RSV. Yes. So um, the regulations about masking and things like that are specific to COVID. So these are COVID outbreaks. We have not had any RSV. Um, we have not had any residents that have tested positive, or we've had two residents test positive with flu this year, um, which is actually something we haven't had in a long time. Um, so there's different protocols for every virus. Um, when it comes to flu, uh, per public health, it requires three positives to be considered an outbreak. Um, otherwise, it's just a one-off case. So we treat those people. Um, typically, they receive Tamiflu from the hospital, and then, which is a medication to treat influenza. And then um, they're in what's called um, contact isolation or droplet isolation so that that way um, we wear gowns in their room and masks and things like that. But it doesn't put the whole house into an outbreak when that happens. Um, that's more of a COVID specific thing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions related to referrals? All right. Uh, next is environmental and facilities, and Scott is online. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yep. Loud and clear, Scott. Good. So the good news is the three garage doors, one in each building, are installed complete and uh, working nicely. That's a huge accomplishment. They finished them up yesterday. Uh, the bus is on order, as probably Carmen reported at the last meeting. Um, I followed through and made sure everything was good to go with the company. So it is in process. So that's good news also. Uh, I filled the custodian position that was vacant for, for part-time custodian. Um, candidate started yesterday. So far, so good. So that's a good thing. We're back to... Uh, all staffed there. Aside from that, everything is uh, going well with uh, work orders and keeping equipment running and keeping everything going smoothly. Any questions? Yeah, man. Well, that's a relief to get the doors in, I would imagine, and uh, we've had good weather. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, short and sweet, mostly sweet. <laughs> and short. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, next is West survey update. So as I reported last month that we had a West survey um, that had a citation in it that we were challenging with the state. Um, so we went through that process. It's called informal dispute resolution or IDR. Um, it is a process that any facility can do with any citation. Typically we only do it with larger citations or something that we really think should not have been cited. Um, so this is the first time uh, that we have done this with the exception to one um, life safety code citation. Um, this is the first time we've done this since I've been here at the neighbors. So it doesn't happen often. Um, but so we did do an IDR process. Um, we worked with um, an attorney that is contracted through leading age our association because um, they do that. That's part of the big role that they play is helping with those situations. Um, and he had strongly encouraged as well. So I called him when we first got the citation and he said, you should fight that. Um, it's worth it. He said he didn't think the citation was should have been cited, all of those things. Um, so we did uh, that process. Basically, we submit a written report. 
uh, to a third party um, company that is contracted with the state to review um, any citations that are contested. We submit a report and then um, shortly after that report, they schedule a call and then we basically have an opportunity to plead our case um, to that third party company. Um, while we're on that call, also our multiple representatives from the state are on that call and the ombudsman office and all sorts of people in total, there were seven of us. Um, so then I basically gave a verbal report about why we believe that the citation was not accurate or in error, we shouldn't have gotten it. Um, and then they basically say, thank you for your report. And that's the end of that. It's not really a discussion. It's kind of a one way conversation. And then shortly after that, they send you um, a letter that says whether it got overturned or not. We were not successful in overturning the citation. So the citation did hold, um, which for reference is, I believe, about 90 some percent of citations are upheld. So it's very rare that they get overturned, but worth a shot. Um, that being said, we did not get issued any civil money penalties or any denials for this citation. Uh, so citations that are a G or higher, which this was considered a G, which is a level of scope and severity, um, can come with civil money penalties, which just basically is a fine um, that the state issues to the facility for having a citation. Um, and the state did not issue any fines. They said due to our past survey history being excellent, and this was something that they saw as a one-off, um, that they were not recommending any citation or any fines at this time. So um, all in all, it's not the worst outcome because we could have had fines with it, um, but we were hoping that it would get overturned and it did not. Any questions on that at all? Does that, what would you, there you go. Do you know kind of an idea how much the fines would have run the cost? It's different with every citation. Um, so it depends on the severity. And then also um, it depends on how long the or the deficient practice was going on. So um, for a situation that's considered an immediate jeopardy, which this wasn't, that's the worst kind of citation. Uh, this was not to that level or not cited at that level. Um, but those are fined by day. Um, typically G citations are just a lump sum fine and it's just based on what they wanna issue. Okay, thank you. Does, will this affect our star rating It will. Um, not immediately. It comes. They come out every three months, so it'll um, it will affect our star rating for the West Building um, for a period of three months, um, and those are those are reassessed every quarter. So it'll come out um, in I believe the next one comes out in April. I think they're on a weird schedule, um, so it'll be. They just came out with new ones, so since that wasn't finalized until last week, it didn't hit our current thing or current reporting time frame for that, but it'll be on the next one. It will affect the star rating. The West building is um, the other two metrics besides the health rating or health survey rating are both at a five. So it should not pull it down below a four. So it will still stay higher. It just will affect um, the one portion of the star rating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, then uh, we're on to G. All right, um, East Complaint Survey. So I put this on here because I wasn't sure if we touched on it last month because it was the same week as our um, committee meeting and I wasn't sure if it was discussed. Um, so we did have a complaint survey in our East building actually the week after our um, regular survey in the West building. Um, so that was just a one-off survey. Um, we had one surveyor there. It was a complaint from a resident who was saying um, that he was not able to go out um, to go into the community and do things by himself, which um, we had multiple records of that he goes out almost every day and does things. Um, so that was pretty quickly um, determined to not um, have any issues with compliance or um, any citations of that matter. But anytime that they get a facility complaint from a resident, a family member, anything, they have to come out and check on them. So um, we had a lot of documentation that the resident goes out almost daily um, and goes and 
does things that he would like in the community. So um, we didn't have any issues with that and they left without um, any citations and it was um, deemed to be unsubstantiated. Thank you. I think you did mention it, but okay. uh, it's nice to hear the things again, because when you're only here month to month, it's so easy to forget. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last thing on my report is of the bus update. And Scott did mention this, that the bus is on order. Um, so we, um, as you're aware, our bus, um, we had fundraised for, and then we also did receive a grant um, related to transit and the ADRC um, for the rest of the bus funds. Um, so we are working on making sure that all goes through appropriately with finance and all the different accounts, because there's multiple accounts that that money is coming out of um, from deferred revenue and um, the grant and all sorts of stuff. So we're just working on that, but the bus should be here in February, I believe. Um, and then the only other thing that we will have to do is get decals and stickers and stuff to decorate the outside of the bus um, to say the neighbors. Um, so we're still working on what we're going to have on that, um, but hopefully it'll be up and running for some spring activities shortly and our residents will be very, very excited. One yeah. quick question. Um, <clears throat> now that we have this bus, mm -hmm. do we have a spot indoors for the bus to be stored? Uh, so during the winter months, uh, we store the bus at the rec park. Um, so when it is um, weather that we <laughs> don't want it to be outside in, uh, we bring it over to the rec park and there is um, covered storage for it there. Um, on the neighbor's campus, we don't have any spot to put it inside. Mm -hmm. Um, but when the weather is inclement, we bring it over to the rec park. We do that with our current bus too. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. <clears throat> They're too expensive not to take care of. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Yeah, that's a great, great question, Tim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, unless there's any other questions for me, that concludes my overall report. That's it, but she's still on the spot if you want her. So. Okay, uh, number seven, consideration for action to be taken by the committee, review of vouchers and financial reports. Jane, thank you for being here with us today. Nice thank to you. see you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm paperless except for what Carmen has provided me because I didn't bring my badge today to print everything myself. So I don't <laughs> see the vouchers in the printed packet, but I'm hoping you have them on your emails. They were, yes. And are there any questions on the vouchers? Yeah, uh, Ms. Supervisor Lino? I did not see them. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, they look pretty standard um, and everything in the right accounts and all the little bunnies in the right homes. <laughs> That's what I check for to make sure our accounting and our records flow at the end of the year. Next uh, month, you might see a couple of bigger charges that are annual charges, things that are every year, um, like our the insurance, mm -hmm. um, RF technology will be on there, um, which is our call eight system. Anything that's a yearly cost will probably show up on next month's financials. Just a heads up for when you're looking at them. There might be some bigger things, and those are prorated throughout the year then. Yep. Okay, so next in the packet that I see is the uh, financials themselves. Um, so we'll dive right in. On um, line one of the intergovernmental uh, revenues, that is short of the budgeted amount because the supplemental payment that came in in the second half of the year it was zero based on our cost reporting that I'm still appealing um, with new auditors and, and a new um, communication system. And we, we, there was a line that was reassessed from one line to the next and Medicaid this year has said, well, we're not gonna switch those lines for you. You have to appeal. So now we are appealing um, a, a number that was on one line and should have been on a different line. Mm -hmm. So those kind of little technical things, but we're hoping to get uh, funding in 2024 to make up for that. So it hopefully can look even better. Um, public charges, you see the, the projected is 14 million where we were budgeted for 13.5, and that's because the Medicaid rates went up substantially um, to offset that supplemental payment that we didn't get. So in the end, it kind of nets out. Um, any questions on that one? So the supplemental payment that you're appealing, 
if you win an appeal and get some, does that go on the 2023, even though we'll receive it in 2024? We'll probably post it in it. We won't probably get it until later after we close up the 23 books okay. and after we've done all of our auditing. So it'll go into 2024 and probably listed as prior year revenue. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. It'll most likely come through in the summer. So how supplemental payment works is it's a two payment system and it goes on the state's fiscal year and their fiscal year starts in July 1. So our payment that was in December was really for this coming, it's half of 2023 and half of 2024. So if they square up on it to say we should have been paid some earlier, um, they would just pay it in June. So we wouldn't see it until the summertime. Okay. Um, the miscellaneous revenue um, is lower than expected. That is the senior meals, basically. Uh, I think the volume of senior meals was lower than we had budgeted. Still a healthy amount, but um, just not as high as we had anticipated. Um, interest money comes from either consumers, the private pay people that have paid interest on late um, payments, or insurance companies that are mandated to pay us if they pay after a certain amount of time that they've had the claim. So that's the 690. Um, the general fund balance that we budgeted for, uh, we didn't need. Um, that was to true up the, um, the budget to make it balance when we entered it uh, a year ago. And donation revenue is, uh, the budgeted amount was the 68 which we have moved into deferred revenues so that we keep those for the bus. And then um, the hundred or the, the thousand dollars is the miscellaneous donations that come in just for activities to use on regular activities, things, purchases of little miscellaneous things or um, music or other activities that people have uh, donated to. Uh, salary and fringe is the total salary and fringe for the entire building and um, is lower than expected because our staff, the agency staff is higher than expected. So in the end, it balances to a higher number than we had anticipated. But now with uh, maybe some more hiring going on, we can reconcile that in the new year will be more salary and fringe and less agency staff which in the end nets out to a better bottom line. Uh, operating expenses were lower than expected. The budget was 3.5 million. We came in at 3 million. Um, there will be some other expenses posted since this, was re, uh, since this was printed. There are some end of the year things that are still trickling in, but not substantial. We caught, I think, almost everything that we, that we could for this report. Uh, depreciation is, is there. And the CIP shows zero. We did not pay for garage doors in 2023. We didn't pay for the bus in 2023. We didn't pay for the trim. We didn't install trim in 2023. So there was no capital um, expense in 2023. So that leaves a negative um, $487,000 um, that in the red for NDC in general. Any questions on that? Supervisor Lino. I'm just kind of wondering, uh, that's a pretty substantial number and being a rookie on this committee, um, how are we going to address that? Sure. Um, so we are looking at trends too. So if you see last year, we had about a million dollar loss so we're heading in the right direction. Um, and then Jane, myself, Chris, and Bietta have been working on a performa to look at the next five-year future and looking at the changes that are happening with the Medicaid rates. Um, also, the supplemental payment is a change in the other direction. Um, and looking at different, um, basically, a five-year lookout. And every year we are projecting having it either less of a loss or um, actually making it into the black again soon. Um, so we're trending in the right direction as we had had a worse year last year and it's getting better. 
Um, hopefully the supplemental payment, we do get some money back because basically exactly what our loss is, is exactly what we're short on the supplemental payment. Um, so we are looking better. Um, when we first went into this year, mm -hmm. at some point we had a projection of a $2 million loss. Okay. Um, so we are, we are projecting and it has been getting improvement. Um, so, and what we're projecting out for the next few years is even better than this too. How serious is this uh, delay of payment from insurance companies? From insurance companies? Yeah, I, I noticed that you had a line there. Uh, we charge interest, oh, interest for late payments and stuff? Um, it's not substantial. Um, the VA, if they um, have clean claims and they've held them too long, that automatically just comes as interest. Um, and we track those claims and we make sure that if there's something wrong, we, we rebill it. If it's just in their queue to hold uh, based on their uh, computer algorithms, then then we get some interest. So are, are you talking 90 days, uh, six months? Uh, uh, what uh, type of lateness are we private talking? Private insurance, if it's a clean claim, needs to be paid within 30 days. Okay. And generally, do they come across? Uh, generally, the private insurance does. We don't have a lot of private insurance. The co-insurance... Uh, for Medicare A people is private insurance. Um, but Medicare has, um, you know, we have a one year period to file the claims. And then once they get them, they can process them within 30 days and then they hold the money for another 30 up to. Uh, so it can be quite delayed. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, Supervisor Leonel's first question about, you know, what, what should we be thinking about with a $500,000 deficit? Uh, if we look over the last, I can't remember what it was, seven or 10 years, there were multiple years where we were in the black. Mm -hmm. And uh, even before the new facility, I, I think that the county uh, kicked in about $500,000 every year to keep the service that we provide going. So this is kind of within the ballpark of what we've done for many, many years. And I see uh, Barb nodding her head. Recall that from covering many county board meetings. Okay, so it's within the ballpark is what we're doing. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And if I could add that there's other nursing homes that are closing because of the staffing issues and the cost of temporary staff. Um, for NDC to weather the storm is important. It's part of, I think, the, the board's. Uh, goals is to support the nursing homes. So I think this is just a, a bump now and I'm looking forward to 2024 being a, a positive year. Yes, we are. There are only two nursing homes in Dunn County. And uh, although we know that uh, people listening to this, uh, although we're considered three. We're considered three. <laughs> but it, so it looks like four, but there really are only two nursing homes in Dunn County, which is just amazing though. And there's a total of 174 beds and we're 137 of them. So um, in the county, between the one other nursing home and NDC, there's only a total of 174 nursing licensed nursing home beds and we're 137. So without us, there's 40. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the need the need appears to be there. Okay. Okay, Thank so, you very much. Okay, Jane. But moving on to the detailed reports, um, the page uh, three of four, it says at the bottom of mine, agency staff financial report. It details the, the agency staff and the total on the right-hand side is 5,571,000. And um, then scrolling over to the 2023 budget, we budgeted 947. That was the difference in the payroll budget. So that's not apples to apples there. Um, but that's what we were expecting to come in at. Um, if we go down to the next NDC nursing staff financial report, it's labeled in the middle of the page and it has a lot of negative numbers there. Disregard that. Next month, I'll have better numbers there. What we did is separated out um, East, West, and Central nursing staff into CNA, LPN, and RNs within our SAP system. And this report did not grab those new cost centers. It took the negative out of the 
<laughs> the one side because we're taking them out of the general nursing fund and then putting them into the detailed nursing cost center. And it only caught half of that transaction. So that is not accurate this month. Um, but the detail on the front page is, so I double checked that and we caught everything on that change. Uh, and the reason for that detail change is so that we can be more compliant with our cost reporting and sort. Any questions on that sheet? And senior meals, the detail um, on senior meals shows that the year-to-date actuals is uh, the revenue was 168,000. We don't have December posted in there, but we do have the expenses. So that should change by, by next month. We'll have everything together there. Then, any questions on the financials in general, of the spreadsheets? Uh, the aging summary, the colored sheet, um, December was lower than November, partially because the um, credits to the Medicaid rates are coming in and we're doing better collecting. Things are, are moving well. My staff is doing a great job. We don't have any turnover. Um, and there's more to bill with, with the other, with Central being open compared to the beginning of the year where um, we didn't have as many beds to bill. So then that that aging would increase slightly because of that. I think it's at a good spot. Uh, the campus census um, for the end of the year numbers, those are, are the final numbers. If you look at the yellow bar, the Medicaid numbers are almost up to the goal, which was the goals were set for being fully opened. Um, so that's good. That's a good pay source. I think that helps us um, financially to, to maintain a high Medicaid census. Uh, the green bar is private pay. That uh, was short of the, the goal, and that's just the nature of the market. People aren't, uh, they don't have as much money set aside, and they go to Medicaid quicker because the rates are, you know, almost $300 a day. In 20, it was 298 in 2023. So that's a lot of money. Which this is, if I can just add one thing, is kind of a mindset change for people who have been on our committee for a while or even new folks, is we used to want private pay to be higher than Medicaid because it used to pay more. At this point, with the way that Medicaid rates have increased, Medicaid's actually a better payer source. So this isn't a bad thing. <laughs> um, so in the past, we would dislike when people were running out of money and we didn't have a lot of private pay because it was less money. And now it's not necessarily a bad thing because Medicaid actually pays more than what our private pay rate is. So it's just a little bit of a mindset change. Yeah. I think where we could make improvement is the Medicare A number. Um, we have a gap there to goal. Last month in November, we met the goal, but that was great. But it's kind of a uh, who, who is available and if we can meet their needs and what the referrals look like. So it's not that we can just dictate, oh, we're going to take 10 more Medicare people this month. It's It has to meet the, can we meet their needs? Are they appropriate for the building? All those other medical issues have to be determined before we can just admit because I want financials to look, you know, I want more Medicare people. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's a, a lot of uh, that goes on before we determine which you know, pay source is a secondary um, concern when we are admitting people. And sometimes the Medicare people, though the it is the highest payer source, if you look at the number that we're getting paid per day for them, it's also the most expensive person to take care of. So the margins may not be there as well with those. So we do get paid more per day for them, um, but they also do cost us more per day as well due to therapy costs, medications are all inclusive. So with Medicare, it is an all inclusive um, payment source. So basically we are on the hook for whatever they need while they're with us, including their medications. Um, if they even go for an outpatient procedure, we're required to pay for it. Um, so sometimes there's also a difference with that as well. For some procedures and then we, yeah. we on the backside, divvy out yeah. portions of the costs. Yep. Um, and the VA is much like Medicaid or Medicare, where it's a consolidated uh, uh, pay source. If they, if we have a VA 
person that has therapy, we just pay for it. They don't pay for it separately. And then the VA's rate schedule will slide up and down based on their acuity. And our VA population has increased uh, quite a bit. So we have that contract. There's generally one contract per county across the nation. And we have that for the Dunn County contract with VA. That is the end of my reporting. Any other questions? I just have a quick question regarding the Medicare A, you said. Mm -hmm. uh, now that essentially is, is doctors referring patients to our facility to get rehab of some sort, right? After, after a hospitalization, generally, okay. yep. And they have to meet different standards uh, to be on Medicare A. You just don't automatically get your 100 days. You have to be making you know, progress and there has to be a reason why you can't get that service somewhere else at home or it can't not it can't meet the uh, custodial definition of you have to, maintenance yeah. you have to have a qualifying diagnosis and so is that it, you know um, are we reaching out to doctors to let them know hey we're over here you know <laughs> uh, yeah so um that so that referral report i would say majority of that 79 people that are referred to us would be a Medicare A stay person because okay. typically um, it does happen every once in a while that we have people that are um, admitted to us directly to long-term care but uh, the most typical thing that happens is someone is admitted to us for short-term care on a Medicare A stay and then because they fell at home or their family went home and saw them and said oh my gosh you need hospital care they go to the hospital they come to us for short-term stay and then they realize they can't go home and then they get admitted long-term. So almost all of our referrals at least start out as a Medicare A stay. Sometimes, um, sometimes particularly to our memory care, those people are admitted directly that are not Med A, um, but the majority of our initial referrals are Medicare A stays. So the hospitals um, know that we are accepting uh, Medicare people. We're here. We're yes. open for business. Absolutely. <laughs> Supervisor Witzel. I was going to ask, so how does that work for if they're going to be admitted as a VA person? They're a vet. Do they have to go see their, their doctor? There's something going on and they admit and, you know, send them to you guys? Or how does that, how does that work with the VA? Kind of the same mm. situation? Similar. Um, so VA is a unique payer source because just because someone is a veteran does not mean that they will get nursing home coverage under the VA care. Um, so it really depends on um, their service, if they were injured in service, if they were um, have some sort of diagnosis directly related to their service. Um, so if they have a disease or an injury or something that is they can be directly linked to their service in the military, then that's typically when they get covered by the VA. And it would be a similar process that they would go to a hospital, whatever it might be, be then referred to us, have VA insurance. Um, and then also if they're on hospice is typically a way that people are have VA coverage. Um, but for the people that have rehab and things like that, it typically has to be directly related to their service. I have one question for the board. Um, well, for next month, we'll review the 2023 financials again, so you know what um, the final word is. And then are there any different reports or data that you're requesting that we present in 2024 or that we should leave off of this financial report? Well, if, well the, uh, the detail, the um, senior meals, or you still want to look at the... Um, the payroll, I would imagine. Yeah. Is there anything else that's missing? If you think just, of it later, let me know. The, the, the only thing that I would be very interested in is just, you know, being able to track agency expense in comparison to employee expense, okay. Okay. you know, that type of thing, seeing that breakdown yeah. that, okay. uh, to really reinforce of, hey, we got to hire these people. And the difference <laughs> in the end, the, the increment of additional expense yeah. yeah exactly okay so that's in there and we'll have the correct tracking numbers next I'll month just have to watch for it or see we'll go it through is. it more yeah. thoroughly next month yep. Right. yep okay um jane uh just kind of a general question then if uh you were not involved with this but you still have your same skills and so forth in the county 
and you looked at this uh, and you had to give a little summary to this committee. Would it be just what you just did or what would what's your overall outlook for coming year for? Um, I think it would be very similar to what we're doing. It, it incorporates uh, the cash flow items and it takes that depreciation out. So you know what your cash flow is every month. I think that's important. Um, and it shows the the detail of really what's going on, what our census is, that we still have a healthy um, inflow of, of clients. Um, and then it has a projection of where we're going to be at the end. Okay, great. Now next year too, uh, just as a reminder, this year we budgeted for all the households open, right? No, we budgeted for one being closed, one, one for 2024. For 2024, we budgeted. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong year. For 2023. Correct. We budgeted for all the households open. So yeah. that meant we budgeted expenses, we budgeted uh, revenues and everything. Correct. So this this year, 2024, it's only going to be 11 out of the, I'm sorry, eight out of the nine. Correct. Eight out of the nine. So that's going to look a little different. The bars are going to look a little different. Everything's going to look a little different. So just to keep that in mind as we go along. Yep. And our expenses, we would expect to be right on and not below the budget. Yep. Good point. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, that was number seven. And... We had some great questions. I would uh, like, please, uh, a motion to accept the voucher and financial reports. So moved. Seconded. Okay, thank you, supervisors. It looks like there are no other questions. Then all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. And next meeting time date, or are there any announcements first? No announcements? Next meeting uh, currently is scheduled for February 22nd, 9 a.m. And we will have um, some carry forwards that have to be discussed at that meeting, um, both the garage door funding um, as well as the bus, as those were items that were on the 2023 budget. We have the money for them, um, but unfortunately, both items came in right in the beginning of 2024 because um, we cannot expense them until they're physically here. So the garage doors went in this week. We were really hoping they'd come in in December and they didn't. Um, so we have to do a carry forward for them. And then we also have to do a carry forward for the donation portion of the um, bus funding. Um, so that'll be on next month's agenda to then go to overall county board as well. Great. Any other comments? Uh, hear none, then we are adjourned. Do you need the board to approve the grant acceptance? Yeah, uh, I think that's, hold on. Let me, oh, yeah. Microphone is still on. Yeah.